All right, just a, a quick reminder. I'll keep saying this for the first two weeks at least. Uh, the Discord lecture channel open on my phone. If you have questions, feel free to hit me up there. I'll try to, my best to keep an eye on it during lecture. And as always, you can just raise your hand and ask the old-fashioned way as well. OK, so um, I kind of lost track of time a little bit last time and didn't get to the examples I want to cover. But I believe there's room in this lecture to cover everything, uh, catch up and cover everything we need. So let's talk about two examples. We left off with the Python example. So uh, and I did last time recommend Python for the course, kind of begrudgingly. Um, but that's just kind of the natural way the course is going. Uh, eventually, down the road, I might uh, just enforce one language in this course. It might actually be Go, but that's down the road. That's not this semester. Uh, this semester, you can still use anything you want. Any language you want to use, you're welcome to use. Um, but I am going to recommend Python. It will it'll be the least headaches in the course. Um, it's the one that most students tend to choose whenever I leave it wide open. And uh, if that holds true, and if I just officially recommend it like I am, I can do more lecture examples strictly in Python and help you out with the Python stuff. So I will still show the number two language is always Node with JavaScript. Uh, so I will show some JavaScript examples, especially before homework one is due. Uh, once homework one comes in, then I get to see what all of you chose. If a lot of you uh, just chose JavaScript anyway, I'll still have some JavaScript examples throughout the lecture. If you choose anything other than those two, you're probably not going to have much for examples, except maybe Scala, because I have a big example built out already for Scala. And I like to use it sometimes. Um, and just to show you another perspective, how you would do it in a strongly typed language. Um, so let's talk about some Python. Let me try to resize this a little bit so we can get to the good stuff, the code. In Python, the very first thing you want to do is import socket server. If you look at the documentation, if you just Google TCP socket server Python, some of them will just say, oh yeah, import socket and then do all this stuff. Don't do that. Don't do it. I'm telling you right now, don't do it. Do socket server and build using socket server. Find documentation that uses socket server and go that route. Socket is just fine for homeworks one and two. Once you get to homework three, if you're using socket, you're going to have to rewrite quite a bit of your code to get it to work with socket server or go through the pain of doing uh, multiple simultaneous connections using the socket library, which is not easy. It's not overly difficult either, but it's just not something, um, it's just not part of the content of this course. You'd be learning something completely separate from the course material, which is fine uh, to learn more things. But um, you know, it's just not necessary for this course. But if you want more practice with lower level programming, go for it. Um, otherwise, socket server, and then focus on the content of this course without working on a tangential topic. When you import, whoa, that scrolls fast. When you import socket server, you're going to create a new server either using TCP server or threading TCP server. They're going to behave the same for homeworks one and two. When you get to homework three, that's when we're going to need multiple connections. That's when we're going to use threading socket ser TCP server. Either one is fine. If you just use threading TCP server right now, less headaches in homework three. Give it a host and a port. I'm using 0000, 000, 000 for my host and 8000 for my port. And then you're going to give it a TCP handler, which is where all of your code goes. And tell it to serve forever. Why would we want it to stop before forever? This TCP handler is a class that you're going to write. It's going to extend the socket server base request handler. This is inheritance. Um, this is, yeah, inheritance. This is inheritance in Python, if you haven't seen the syntax, other than last Friday. That was three days ago, though. We already forgot that. Uh, this is inheritance in Python. I'm creating a class named this. And then in parentheses, kind of looks like a constructor, especially in Scala. It looks like a constructor parameter. This is actually extending that class. This is the notation for my TCP handler extends socket server dot base request handler. So we're inheriting all the functionality from base request handler, which is conveniently what the socket server needs. When you create a socket server, when you create a TCP server, it's going to need this uh, 
something of type base request handler, and we're going to have something of type base request handler because we're extending it. We're going to use some polymorphism here and extend the functionality of base request handler while still being a base request handler. And then the handle method. This is where all the action is. Inside the handle method, which we're going to override from base request handler, inside this method, this is where we're going to handle any information that's sent to us over the socket server. Whenever a connection is made, so whenever somebody goes to their browser and types in, uh, in this case, localhost colon 8000, 8, they're going to send data to the server, and we're going to, uh, and that server is going to call our handle method for that connection. So in that connection, a connection was made, we have a connection, this method is called, and then it's in our hands after that. So everything I just said, that's the TCP setup. That's what we're using libraries for. We're saying, hey, Python, socket server, take care of all this stuff for me. I don't want to mess with three-way handshakes and sequence numbers and packets and IP and any of that. I don't want to think about any of that. Set up a connection, and whenever information is sent over that TCP, or let me back up, whenever a connection is established, so right after that three-way handshake, call this method, and then we're going to stay in this method for that entire TCP connection. I have to be careful the way I word that because it's a little bit different in JavaScript and some other languages, uh, which we'll get to the JavaScript example too, and I'll show you how that's a little bit different. And this is a class. You're going to have an object of this type. So if you want any, um, uh, any variables, you can put them out here. I define this as a class variable. Uh, we, we don't have to get into the specifics of Python here, but, but I did define this as a class variable, not a, uh, not a field or a state variable. Uh, but I, I have this just in case I need some data. I'm not going to use this for this example. It's not pertinent to what we're doing right now. But as an example of if you want some data that persists across all connections, then you can put variables in there and have some class variables in your TCP handler. OK, so once we're inside this, this means a connection was established. As an example, I put well true there. You can do that, but I don't recommend it. Uh, that'll come up again in homework, through, uh, homework two, actually. We'll want to do that. Once a, a connection is established, we have access to this request object, which has a receive method. This right here. That line is going to say, go to the TCP socket and read some bytes from the socket. Now remember, and this is going to be a theme throughout today's whole lecture and the whole course, really, the internet can only communicate ones and zeros. So when I read off of this TCP socket, I'm not getting strings, I'm not getting objects, I'm not getting anything fancy at all, anything with any level of meaning. I'm just getting ones and zeros. That's it. That's all I can read. So when we read this, we're reading the data as a byte array. We like to group our ones and zeros in groups of eight and call them bytes. So that's exactly what we're doing here. When we receive this data, we're going to the TCP connection, and we're saying, if there's data for me to read, give me that data in a byte array, and give me at most 1K bytes. That 1K, that 1024, is the buffer size it's saying read at most 1K bytes. So we want to make sure, at least for, for homework one, that that array, uh, that value is greater than any, the size of any message that we're going to be sent, any HTTP request. 1024 is going to do it for us in homework one. Set that to 1024, read from, uh, read from the socket, and get your bytes, and then start handling that request. So receive data is going to be a byte array. And we got to start, and it's going to be an HTTP request for our purposes. You can communicate anything over TCP, but for our purposes, we're communicating HTTP requests and responses. So we're going to get that data. I'm going to print out a little bit of information about it. Inside this client address, we have a few values. Zero is going to be the host. 
and one is going to be the port number of that connection. So the client, just like the server, has to have a host and port. And I'm just going to print those to the screen so we can look at some information. Bless you. Where did, oh, I got my phone right here. I'm like, where's my phone? I should have. Could, could you tell us more? Yeah, I'll tell you more about that when I get there, Toadfish. Uh, that's, this is going to be very important, actually, for debugging purposes. Uh, I'm going to print out just the length of the received data, just get some information here. And also, and I want to add to this a little bit. I'm going to print out that data. And I'm going to print it out decoded. So when I print out the data, I'm just printing out a byte array. Just an array of bytes. It's probably going to print as, uh, it's actually going to print as ASCII anyway, but we'll talk about that. And then I'm going to decode it. If you looked at any tutorials in Python so far, you're going to see decoded in encode all over that. This is saying, hey, I know this is a byte array, but I know that this byte array represents a string. Can you decode that from bytes into a string? And by default, Python's going to use the UTF-8 encoding for that and say, hey, these bytes, I expect it to be a string. Give it to me as a string. So when I decode it, it's going to be a string. And then I can do all my string parsing after that. This is the first thing you'll want to do in all of your requests for homework one. I'll put an asterisk on there for homework one. We're going to do a lot of string parsing. You're going to decode into a string. In uh, and fulfill the prophecy of string parsing the class, CC312. You're going to do a lot of string parsing. Uh, when we get to homework two, we're going to move into the world of byte parsing. We're going to have to parse the bytes before we decode. For a little bit of foreshadow, it's when a user is uploading an image. That image is not a string, so we can't decode the entire request. For now, homework one, everything's a string in our requests, so we can uh, safely decode the entire request. This I'm not doing anything with. Let me just comment this out. That's using this client's, uh, client's variable. I'm going to print a few new lines just so each, when I get another request, uh, they're not on top of each other. And then these flush commands. Let's talk about these toadfish. Just, I could zoom in on this. Yeah, self is the same as this. Python just had to be different, so Python uses self instead of this. Don't ask me why, uh, but that's the way it is. If we decode it, it means it's already encoded, yes. So whenever strings are sent over the internet, they're encoded using an encoding. That means you're taking a string, which only your language speaks. Only Python speaks Python strings. You're taking those strings and encoding them into a byte array and then sending the bytes, which everybody speaks. So whenever you're communicating strings over the internet, you have to encode them as bytes, because that way every single language on the planet can speak that language. But a Python string class, like JavaScript doesn't know what that is. So we have to encode to bytes, send it, and then on the other end, whatever language we're talking to is going to decode it back into a string in their language, decode it into a, uh, a JavaScript string using a JavaScript string class. OK, these two lines, these will be very important for debugging, flushing standard out and standard error, uh, specifically when you're running your code in Docker. So if you have these lines, you don't have to hear me say this in office hours, but when you have these lines in here, this is telling standard out and standard error whenever you print to the screen hey, whatever you have buffered, print it to the screen. For some reason, and only in Python th that I've seen, when you print to the screen in Python from within a Docker container, it, the Docker container will buffer the output, and you won't see any output as you're running your app. So you might have print statements like I have here, and you want to see some debug information. You won't see any of that information right away. Uh, in certain circumstances, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know, it's weird. I, and I still don't know what causes this. Uh, Python alone won't have this problem, but you run it in Docker and it does, so something Docker's doing. Anyway, Flush is going to say, hey, whatever you have buffered, 
print it to the screen right now. Like, stop waiting. Just print it to the screen and let my human see it. Uh, so put these two lines, whether you have errors or just regular standard out, uh, it'll actually print those to the screen. And if you're running outside of Docker, these two lines just don't do anything. You might get a, you know, a few nanoseconds of a performance hit. Who cares? But uh, uh, flush those things to the screen. And then finally, I want to send something back. So for your homework, this is where you would do all your string parsing. You would take the decoded request, start splitting on slash r slash ends, read the path, read the request type, figure out what's being requested, process that, and then send an appropriate response. I'm not going to show you all that because I'm not just going to do the homework for you, but I am going to show you the setup, which is right here. Uh, so you take this, parse it, and then send something based on what's being requested. For this server, I'm just sending this response every single time. Let's try to get this on a few different lines here. It's not going to, you know, never mind. Not messing with that right now. Uh, so this self.request.send all is going to take a byte array and send it over the TCP connection, send it back to the client. Let's go take these bytes and send them back to the browser. So I'm going to send my response line in the format we saw in the slides. I'm going to have my new line characters as slash r slash n. I'm going to have my headers, which include content length and content type. And I'm going to have a char set UTF-8 on my content type, even though I don't have any UTF-8 characters here. I'm going to have a blank line, and then my content is just hello. So this server is super boring. No matter what request is sent to the server, it's just going to send back hello as a plain text string. Super boring server, but it is a web server, technically. It, speaks, uh, it does speak H, uh, HTTP. And then since that's a string and I can only send bytes, I'm going to encode that string into a byte array and then send that encoded byte array over the TCP socket to be, go off into the internet and over to my client's browser. I have to encode that first. It has to be a byte array. can't be a string. So I want to send a string, take my string, encode it into bytes, and then send the bytes. And then the other end can worry about decoding that as a UTF-8 string. So if we run this server, which it may or may not still be running. Yeah, it looks like it's running. I mean, it's running since Friday with my laptop going to sleep. So we'll see if it actually is still listening. I'm going to go to localhost 8000. And it says hello. Yay. Goodness, that's bright. So our web server worked. We went to the, the browser. The browser is going to be our TCP client. So whenever you're setting up your web server and you want to test, go to the browser and go to your localhost uh, 8080 slash hello, or 8000 in, in my case here. Uh, we'll talk about 8080 the rest of this week. That's when you add Docker to it. Docker needs to be listed on 8080 for our homeworks. So we can see that we got a few requests. And we can take a look at what these requests are going to look like. Oops. When you actually send a request using a browser. So the first thing we print out is the client ID is sending. Client ID is going to be 127001. That's the IP address for localhost. It's a very special IP address that says, that's this computer. This computer sent a message to this computer. The port number, 64463. When a browser sends a request, and y'all let me get away with this last week, but when a, a browser sends a request, it's not using port 80. Port 80 is, like the, is the default port for HTTP, only for web servers, not for web clients. Web clients don't use port 80. The browser, when it needs to send a message to a web server, it's going to ask the operating system for some randomish port number, usually a re really high port number like this. It's going to reserve that port number and then send a request. So if I got in that example where I have 10 tabs open, I have 10 different TCP connections on 10 different ports to 10 different web, uh, web servers. So the port that I randomly rolled here, 64, 463. And then I sent 721 bytes 
and all kinds of headers. Most importantly, this is a get request for the root path. And lots of headers in here somewhere. We're going to see content type and content length. Oh, no, we're not, because this is a get request. My bad. Uh, but we're going to see all kinds of information about the request. Most of this we're not too concerned about as of right now. Um, and then we got another get request for favicon.ico. You're going to get this sometimes. It's OK to respond with a 404. Uh, this, it's not defined in your homework. This is a request for the icon that shows up in the header of that tab. So that little icon that shows up like right here, right here, uh, that globe, that's like the lack of an icon. So the browser is usually going to automatically send that. If you see those in your debugging, don't worry about it. Just respond with a 404. Call it good. Probably should just add that to homework one instead of saying that. We could have an icon on the sample site. So we got a few requests. We responded with a response each time that just says hello. And that's our very first web server written in pure Python off of a TCP socket. So for most of this class, it's all about parsing this, figuring out what you're supposed to do, and then sending the appropriate thing back. And usually, you're going to have a big if, else if, else if, else if statement here. You're going to parse this, figure out the request type, the method type, um, or the request method, sorry, <laughs> my words there, uh, and the path. And then you'll say if request, uh, uh, if request method equals get and uh, path equals slash, do this. Else if request type equals get and path equals hello, do this. And you have a big else if block. Uh, there are better ways to clean that up. We'll talk about throughout the semester. Uh, but if you have a big else if, else if, else if block, and then else send 404, it's perfectly fine. All right, and then quickly the and quickly in Python. Ooh. Okay, it looks like TA's got that. Nope. You should be able to send Zelgo. Not hundred percent familiar with I think Zelgo is just UTF-8 characters, right? That have like directors. What? Okay. I I think that I think that should work. Any good tips for designing routing? Um, yeah, I like to use. Uh, if you use regex, you can clean up that a lot. I do have an example of that. I'll show later in the class. Uh, but I had to show it after homework one's due because it's basically the solution to homework one. It contains the solution to homework one. But after homework one, I'll show you a way to do routing using regex, which uh, can clean up your else if block a lot. Yeah? Um, so, so obviously you said your get request will end with CRLS, CRLS. Mm -hmm. But I would like to parse this get request did with early mode, and I could not find the ending CRLS, CRLS on that. It should have been in there. Did I never? Oh, I changed this after I. It should be there. But uh, uh, I'm not going to mess with it during lecture. But I, I added that print, the bytes, the raw bytes. But I had the server running before I added that line, or else I could pull that up. Uh, and my Python server doesn't like to die. So. Uh, uh, I'll have to hold off on that. But it should be there. Um, I don't know what would cause it to not be there. Because the I think browser should be sending that, that blank line at the end. Um, you can send me an email, and, and I can look into that. Because that, uh, that should be there. All right, but let's talk about JavaScript real quick. And I just looked at the time. Uh, we got to get to the slides, too. But JavaScript, if you are going to be using JavaScript, it's the net library. The net library has a create server method, 
which is going to create your server. It's going to take a callback function, which takes a socket as a parameter, and socket.onData, whenever you receive data, call this function, and this is the function that's going to handle all your requests. After all these callbacks, give it a dot .listen on your host and port, and then this server will be listening on port 8000 in this example. This function, unlike uh, Python, this function is called every time data is read off the socket. So JavaScript is going to be reading data off of all connections, and whenever there's data to be read from any connection, it's going to call this callback function. It's going to call this function for you, and then the bytes are going to be in data, and that's what you're going to parse and, and handle appropriately. Uh, this is called every time data is received. So if you have multiple connections, again, this won't be relevant until homework three, but if you have multiple connections, this function could be called once for this connection, then for this connection, then for this connection. It could be all interlaced and stuff. So that's something you have to be aware of. That's where the remote address and remote port really come in handy. So you can check, okay, I got data. Who sent me this data? Which one of my connections sent me this data? And then you can handle it appropriately. Data is going to be bytes. So if you want to handle it as a string, hit it with two string. Then I do have a little bit of parsing code for you. Uh, I'm going to split on new lines, get the first line. This is the kind of stuff you'll be doing in your homework. Split on spaces, get the request type, the path, the HTTP version, and then handle it. If this is a get request for the root path, send something else, send the 404. And then you'd have a bunch of else ifs in there as well. When you send in JavaScript, socket.write. Socket.write, if you give it a string, it'll automatically convert it to um, two bytes, if you're worried about that. Or you can use a buffer. If you do buffer.from and a, give it a string, it'll give you a byte array in JavaScript. So just a few quick things if you're using JavaScript. But we need to get to some slides. Can I use connection type instead of data? I'm not quite sure what that means. All right, so let's talk about some encodings. So the internet can only speak, I should change my slides to white text on a black background. Would that be better? This is, I can tell the whole room just lit up when I went onto these slides. Uh, I gotta change that, um, especially at 10 a.m. It's a bit much. So can I just, there's no way. Yeah, there's no way that's gonna be an option. Uh, so the internet can only speak ones and zeros. This is going to be true forever. Uh, well, I mean, unless the internet itself changes, but it's going to be true throughout this class. In copper, this is higher low voltage. In fiber, it's light or dark. Whatever the, the transmission we're sending, uh, it's going to be only ones and zeros. Any, uh, any connection on the internet can only speak ones and zeros. So we got to be aware of that in this class. In most uh, CC classes and most programming, you can kind of get away with not really knowing that machines only speak ones and zeros. But when we're speaking, uh, when we're talking about the internet like this, we do have to be a bit aware of that to uh, be able to get our stuff to work. So how do we know what those ones and zeros represent? MIME types. This is one of the very first things. First of all, string encodings. We'll talk about that in these slides as well. But MIME types as well. The MIME type is going to tell an HTTP server or client what type of data is being encoded in these bytes, in the body of a request or a response. So the MIME type is going to be in that content type header. 
So far, we've only seen text slash plain. That's a MIME type to say this is plain text. This is just text. Decode it uh, using a text encoding. And if you specify the encoding specifically, decode it using that encoding. We saw char set equals UTF-8 in the example. That's saying decode this. This is plain text and decode it using UTF-8. MIME types are split into a type and a subtype separated by a slash. So any content type header, you're always going to see two strings separated by a slash, and that's going to specify the MIME type. The types, text we've seen, and we'll see a bit more of, images, videos, what kind of top level type of information is this, are these bytes? And there are a lot of subtypes. Some of the ones we'll use, text plain we've seen, text HTML, text CSS, text JavaScript. Those are the three we're going to use to send the, the guts of our page when we send all of, the, uh, uh, all of the front end out there. And then if we have any multimedia, image JPEG you're going to use in the homework, image PNG if we had uh, portable network graphics. And if you want to send video, video slash MP4. These are named pretty well. They're named uh, pretty straightforward as to what they are for the most part. Uh, until you get to JSON, it's application slash JSON. I don't know why. It should probably, uh, do I? Never mind. Uh, if you want extra information in the content type, separate any extra information by semicolons. So the content type is always going to start with the MIME type. And then if you need any other directives, semicolon and then a key value pair separated by an equal sign. So for starting with objective two, you'll have to specify that these are UTF-8 encoded strings. So if you want to send HTML with UTF-8 characters, which there are in uh, the JavaScript and the HTML for objective two, content type text slash HTML, I'm sending you HTML browser, and the char set is UTF-8. If you don't do this, the browser might default to some other encoding, which doesn't contain UTF-8 characters. So always specify this char set equals UTF-8 if you're sending UTF-8. Uh, or any time you send a string, UTF-8 is a safe, uh, safe encoding to use. If you don't have content type, or if you have the wrong content type, browsers will do something called content type sniffing or MIME sniffing they'll guess what the content type is. So for example, if you send some CSS to a, uh, to a browser and you say content type text slash HTML char set equals UTF-8, the browser's gonna look at that, and most browsers are pretty sophisticated with this. They're gonna look at this and be like, I can't decode this as HTML, but it sure looks like CSS. I'm just going to say that this is CSS. I'm just going to figure it out. And then it's going to interpret it as CSS. In most cases, we don't want our browsers to do this. Because this is the browser saying, hey, I'm smarter than you, developer. You messed up, and I'm going to fix it, which browsers do for us a lot, by the way. Uh, we don't want the browser doing that. We want to say, no, browser, I got the right content type. Don't try to fix it for me. Don't sniff out the correct MIME type. To do that, and this is required on your objectives on the homework, you set a header, X content type, options, no sniff. This is saying, browser, I got this. I have the right MIME types. Don't mess with my MIME types. My content types are fine. Don't try to figure things out. Just use this MIME type. If you, if you do make a mistake and you have the wrong MIME type and you have this no sniff header, your content won't render, and you'll get an error in the browser, uh, in the browser console, uh, which I find very helpful. I'm going to see that error. I'm going to say, oh, I messed something up, and then I can go fix it. Because what if the browser you're testing on, say you don't do that. The browser you're testing on sniffs out the correct MIME type, but some other browser doesn't. Because you're just relying on the browser to fix your mistake at that point. We're not going to do that. We're going to say, look it, my content type's right. If you detect that my content type is not right, just let me know so I can fix it. Don't just fix my mistake for me. Somebody's using an out-of-date browser that doesn't do that. You know, Lots of things can go wrong. And there are even security concerns here. 
So say I have, uh, say I have a site like you're going to build in homework two, where users can upload images to the site, and those images are displayed to all other users. And say some smart, uh, uh, say some user, some malicious user says, well, instead of uploading an image, I'm going to upload some JavaScript. I'm going to upload my attack script that steals everybody's private information. And I'm going to upload that as an image. And then our server is going to serve that as an image, content type, image slash uh, JPEG. And the browser goes, don't look like an image. Looks like JavaScript. I'm going to run it. I'm going to run it as JavaScript. Well, now everybody on, who uses your site just got hacked. So we don't want this. We want to say, don't sniff out the content type. If this don't look like an image, just don't render it. Don't try to run it as JavaScript and run somebody's attack code or their HTML or whatever it may be that they're trying to attack us with. They might get really smart and try to attack us with CSS. I don't know. We're not going to allow it. We're just going to set the content type to what we expect. And then if it's not what we expect, just let us know. Hey, browser, let me know. Don't render it. So we're going to set that no sniff on every response that we have. Uh, aside, I don't think I added that to objective one when it's just plain text. Uh, but aside from that, maybe I did. Um, but it needs to be on there. So the MIME type, it's going to let the browser know when we send a response what type of information that is. And also when users send us information, when we have post requests, it's going to let us know how to parse the body of this request uh, by letting us know what type it is. Like I said before, you can kind of get away without reading these in this class. Because based on the method and the path, you know, the homework is specified. Like if you get a request on this path, it's somebody uploading an image. It's going to be a JPEG. You know. Um, so yeah, you can kind of get away with it. But when you send your responses, you have to have the correct content type, that correct MIME type. When you send information to the browser, that's where you really have to get your uh, content types correct. The internet can only speak ones and zeros. What about text? We've kind of been talking about it throughout, but let's, uh, let's face this straight on. How are we going to send text as ones and zeros? We have to use a text encoding. So we have to take these characters, these letters, numbers, special characters, et cetera, and encode them as ones and zeros or as bytes. So to do this, we're going to pull out ASCII, or we could, rather which is going to be a character encoding. It maps each character to a 7-bit value, which can then be sent over the internet. And every language, every piece of code somebody writes can say, oh, this is ASCII. I know that that 7-bit character means lowercase a. And then it can decode appropriately and get the information in a string in that language. For headers, for the request line, the response line, and any headers, Everything up until that blank line in HTTP has to be ASCII. And this is very important for the internet to work. All that has to be ASCII. So when we receive information, one of the first things we have to do before we start reading the body of an HTTP request, we have to read the content type to figure out what those bytes in the body represent. So how are we going to read the content type to know how to decode that, which the content type is just bytes, if we can't decode the content type? So we have to have some encoding. Something had to be chosen as the encoding for the headers, and it was ASCII that was chosen. So only ASCII characters in the headers of an HTTP request or response. So when you get a request, you can safely look for the blank line in bytes and then parse all the headers as ASCII text. Now, for homework one, you can parse the entire thing as ASCII text. Uh, starting with homework two, this will be, uh, you'll, you'll see why this is more important. But ASCII only for headers. Here's ASCII in its entirety. That's what all the characters map to. Uh, if I want to represent 
uh, 2. That's going to be 50 in decimal, 32 in hex. And the hex um, can be encoded into our binary, into ones and zeros. So 3, 2, that's going to be uh, 0, 0. I shouldn't even do this live. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. And then 2 is uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. I might have said the wrong number. Um, but we usually visualize it as hex, taking each group of, no, I did that way wrong, didn't I? It's 0101, 0, 0010. Zero, zero, zero. Uh, hex, each character is four bits, uh, just because it's more visually appealing to us instead of seeing all the ones and zeros. So we usually represent it like that. But don't get fooled, that is binary. So ASCII is great for certain applications. If I want to encode hello, I'm going to encode it as hex. I'm going to use my chart, look it up. Or realistically, I'm just going to have my language do it. I'm going to do dot encode. Uh, that's going to be the hex equivalent of this. And in binary, it's going to be this. This is what's sent over the internet when I want to send the string hello. This is what I'm actually sending, just those bytes. I already hit on that. That's headers can only be ASCII. Uh, so ASCII, it, I mean, it's fine, but it's got severe limitations. First of all, we can only encode 128 characters, and most of those characters are for the English alphabet. If you want to use something other than English, ASCII just is not going to do it for you. If you want to have really anything else, it uh, doesn't work. It, it's clear that this was invented in America because it, it's very uh, English specific. So this isn't very good for the internet. We have a very global internet these days. ASCII ain't cutting it. We are stuck with it for HTTP headers, though. Uh, aside from the headers, we're going to use something more, uh, something more. UTF-8. UTF-8 is going to be what we'll use for just about everything. Um, most languages will default to UTF-8. Python encode and decode defaults to UTF-8. Uh, this is the standard that we use for string encoding in the modern day. UTF-8 is going to use up to four bytes to encode a single character. Four bytes to encode a single character, up to. And we have a strict convention to know how many bytes if the first byte of a character starts with a zero, the next seven bits will be the uh, character encoding. And these are exactly ASCII. ASCII needs seven bits to represent those 128 characters. If our byte starts with a zero, we got ourselves an ASCII character, which is super convenient because that means all ASCII strings are valid UTF-8 strings. ASCII is a subset of UTF-8. So any, if you encode using ASCII and decode using UTF-8, that works perfectly fine. So very handy thing, very nice feature to have. If the character needs more than one byte, we're going to start with leading ones, indicating the number of bytes. Two leading ones, then a zero, means we got a two-byte character. Three leading ones and a zero, that's a three-byte character, et cetera. Each continuation byte is going to start with one zero and then six bits for the actual character itself. And in this way, we have one really nice feature with ASCII or with uh, UTF-8 is that no character is a subsequence of another character, which really reduces the decoding errors. We can't, uh, can't really make a, a mistake of thinking that this is two two-byte characters instead of one four-byte character. We can't make the mistake because no characters are subsequences of another character. We know that that's a four byte character because it started with four leading ones and a zero. Just got ahead of my slides. So, whenever we're sending data, we have a string, encode it using UTF 8, and then send it. Whenever we're receiving data, we're receiving bytes. That's a UTF-8 encoded string. We'll decode it and then start parsing it as a string. So when you see those encode and decode in Python, um, that's what we have to do. When we see that two string in JavaScript, 
that's reading bytes and converting it to a string. And then, uh, did I say Python again? I meant JavaScript. In JavaScript, and when we send information in JavaScript, it automatically does the encoding for us, but we can do it manually using buffer.from that's doing the encoding for that string. And again, JavaScript will default to UTF-8 as well. But you can specify the encoding, just to be 100% sure. The content length is not the number of characters in a string. It's not the number of characters in the string. It's the number of bytes in the body of the request or response, the number of bytes. So when we have some characters that are multiple bytes, we can't use the length of the string for the content length. We'll get away with that for ASCII. If you have ASCII-only characters, you would get away with that because every character is represented in exactly one byte. But when you have non-ASCII characters, then you have to compute, we have to make sure the content length is computed by the length of the byte array. So in JavaScript, this means buffer.from, get your byte array, and then get the length of that as your content length. In Python, this means encode your string first, get the byte array, and then get the length of that byte array as your content length. You have to make sure you're in the world of bytes before you compute your content length. If you compute your content length of the string, you're going to be missing some information because the browser is only going to read content length number of bytes. So if your content length is less than the number of bytes, that whatever's at the end of your response, the browser's just not going to read it. It will hold to your content length. The content length is also only the bytes in the body. It does not count any of the headers. It's only the length of the number of bytes in the body. So after that blank line, it's the number of bytes after that blank line. Convert to bytes, then compute the length. Uh, we'll have to save non-text data for next time because we got a, oh my goodness. I got two, I got two uh, presentations going at the same time. We'll save that for next time because we got to get this lecture question. Hopefully everyone gets this one, but last, uh, on Friday in 116, I did just about the same thing I just did where I say the answer and then put the question kind of inadvertently. And, uh, Oh, good, good call. Oh shit. Um, I don't. I don't think I have the form on this laptop. I have my other laptop. Uh, if I can fix it in like one second, we'll do it. Okay, you should be able to refresh. The form should be there now. I gotta do that for the one sixteen question too. I forgot it on both. All right, and once you submit the question, you, you know, you can leave, and I'll see everyone Wednesday.